I'm just going to give you a little bit of context um, uh, in terms of sort of looking at um, migration waves um, from outside and within the um, English-speaking Caribbean um, in the 19th century, in the period immediately after the abolition of slavery. Um, just to uh, give you an idea of what is the, um, the, 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 the population of the asylums that I'm, that I'm looking at in that particular period. Um, you can, not sure how, um, how well you can see that, but um, there are different waves of um, migration that follow the abolition of slavery. Um, as early as 1836, uh, there are small numbers of Portuguese from Madeira which are uh, introduced to British Guyana um, the, f for different reasons. The, the main reason was to try and import wh a white labor force that would uh, raise the profile of agricultural labor so that the, um, the slaves that had abandoned the plantations would be persuaded to come back and look at agricultural labor in a different way. That didn't quite work out for all sorts of reasons. And uh, planters, particularly in Guyana, they were forced to look elsewhere. They looked at, um, particularly at India and China, for alternative sources of labor. And um, in um, 1836, um, John Gladstone, who was the father of the uh, future prime minister, um, took it upon himself to actually start as a private enterprise the introduction of Indian laborers to um, British Guyana. He had some extensive plantations in Guyana, so he um, wrote to a company in Calcutta, a shipping company in Calcutta, asking them whether it was possible to bring some Indian workers to, um, to work in, in, in the Caribbean. Um, he had a very positive response, and from 1838 um, there is a, there is a, a um, sort of the beginning of different waves of migration from India to different parts of the Caribbean, particularly uh, British Guyana, Trinidad, and, and Jamaica. Um, the, the first lot of Indians arrived in, um, in May 1838, and there were 437 immigrants, of which 155 were men, five women, and 10 children. And that um, disproportion between the number of men and women um, is very significant, and um, it's something that um, was never a problem that was never solved up to 1917, when Indian indentorship was finally um, brought to an end. Um, and that disproportion in the number of women and also um, all sorts of irregularities in the recruitment process in, in India where uh, people were basically promised that they were going to just do some easy garden labor and earn plenty of money uh, in a colony that was not too far uh, from India. Uh, they had no idea where they were going, so they were tricked into um, emigrating, uh, into leaving their country. So... Um, those were the main reasons for sort of several interruptions to the system uh, as early as 1839. So the planters in Guyana became very concerned as they uh, approached um, sort of the end of apprenticeship. They were concerned that they wouldn't have anybody to work on their plantations. So they also looked at China and they began to um, introduce sort of, num sort of uh, smaller numbers of Chinese immigrants under contracts of, uh, contracts of indentorship. To, um, to British Guyana um, and then also to Trinidad and, and in much smaller numbers to, um, to Jamaica. Um, at the same time, and it's something that uh, unfortunately um, does not appear there, but um, there, was, there were some streams of internal migration within the Caribbean and particularly a strong movement from um, the smaller islands which had a high concentration, a high um, um, sort of high numbers of population compared to the availability of land um, from places like Barbados, for example, which was a very small island, and um, um, there was, a, there was a, a, a strong movement from those islands to some of the larger territories in, in the Caribbean. So um, what happens is that um, this is the, the, the phase where, um, this is the time where um, mental health institutions are um, first established in the Caribbean. And the statistics, the data, um, that um, sort of the records for the intake of um, the admissions for the asylums reflect the different um, ethnicities, sort of the different waves of migration that go on um, at that particular period. 
Um, just trying to make my paper fit into 30 minutes, so I, I promise I'll get there. Um, now, um, in terms of um, what institutions were created, Jamaica was the only place, um, Len Smith has pointed out, that Jamaica was the only place that had uh, a lunatic asylum um, at the time of abolition in 1834. Um, in other colonies, um, most of the asylums were built between the 1840s and the 1850s, uh, during the 1840s and the 1850s. Um, some of them were newly built, some others were sort of um, previous uh, military buildings that were converted into mental, um, mental institutions. Um, in Trinidad, that's a picture from 1906, I couldn't find a previous one, but the first asylum was established in 1858, and uh, there was an extensive presence of um, East Indians in Trinidad, and large numbers of East Indians that ended up, um, that, that, that were recorded as being admitted to the asylum between 1880s and 1890s. And there are several sort of fluctuations in the numbers. Uh, there is um, the statistics, for example, for 1883 um, record about 44% of patients as being um, of East Indian um, origin. And then there, there are different fluctuations of the years. There are um, years like 1887, where the proportion is considerably lower. You've only got 32 Indians admitted to those in, in that particular year. But what's striking is the equal number of men and women, because if you think about the, the much smaller number of women <coughs> that were present in the colony, that's, that's quite interesting. And also in terms of Barbados, the, the general intake was about 20 Barbadians per year, so it's particularly low at that particular, in, in that particular table as well. <coughs> By 1899, the number of inmates born in England, in, in, in India, had um, declined to 26 patients in the Trinidadian asyl, asylum. So the numbers kept going down, and it's interesting that um, the um, superintendent of the asylum at the time in his uh, annual reports, keeps stressing the importance of um, a, 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 an ordinance uh, that uh, basically regulated the price of cannabis um, in the colony because um, he saw a really strong connection, as in other places, in, in lots of other colonies, he saw a strong connection between the consumption of, uh, of cannabis and um, the high incidence of mental illness. But although, um, just to go back to that one um, for a second, um, that's something that comes up in Guyana as well, uh, but there are obviously lots of different issues connected to that. Uh, but although um, the superintendent in Trinidad, uh, George II, although he stresses the high proportion of immigrants um, in relation to natives of the colony, he doesn't, um, he doesn't actually... Um, relate that figure to the total population of the colony. And he doesn't um, make any observations as to the clinical or social significance of the data that is collected. Um, whilst in Guyana, that's the, well, it's just a, a, a picture of the asylum in British Guyana um, that was first established in 1842 and then it was moved to that location in 1867. Um, there, there are two doctors in particular um, that worked um, at that institution that make uh, very significant observations when it comes to the relation between um, migration and mental illness. Um, in the Journal of Mental Science for 1876, Dr. James Donald um, uh, publishes an article which is called Notes on Lunacy in British Guyana. And um, he was the resident surgeon at that institution. Um, and his opening remarks were, um, few countries, if any, afford better opportunities for the study of insanity as exhibited among different races than British Guyana. Here, gathered together in one asylum, are West Indians, coolies from India, Chinese, Portuguese, and Africans. And although the types of insanity are very similar in all, yet there are some distinctive features worthy of being noted. And he makes some um, very interesting observations um, and shows a remarkable awareness of um, and sensitivity towards issues of language and culture, uh, something which is rarely present in the literature produced by his colleagues, especially in relation to the Caribbean. 
Um, he mentions the difficulties in gathering reliable information on patient history due to the uh, difficulty in communicating directly with the patients, and he mentions in particular the, dif the difficulty of speaking with the Chinese patients. But most importantly, he suggests that to compare the proportion of insane in British Guyana to that of the insane in England is very difficult owing to uh, the fact that in many cases national peculiarity is, dis is mistaken for mental derangement. And I thought that was, uh, uh, when I came across that particular um, sentence, I thought he, he, it, uh, it's something that I haven't found anywhere else in, in, in the literature produced by his colleagues. Um, and uh, he seems to be incredibly aware of the contradictions of his role as a colonial doctor, which is something, at that particular point, um, quite remarkable. Um, on the other hand, he fails, for example, to distinguish between Creoles coming from different areas within the region, and he groups together the Creoles of Guyana and the Creoles of Barbados. Um, he also um, attributes specific disorders to different ethnic groups. Uh, he talks about um, social and behavioral causes of insanity. Uh, he um, talks, for example, about malnutrition in relation to East Indian immigrants and intemperance in the case of the Creoles and the Portuguese. Um, in the case of the Indian coolies, he also um, talks about destructiveness and impulsiveness and homicidal and suicidal propensities. Um, and again, it's a much broader discourse, but um, all those observations, if, um, if we consider the context in which the identity immigrants were actually living outside of the asylum, um, it's, it's very likely that most of those um, kinds of behavior were actually um, sort of expressions of, of rebellion on the plantation or um, their unwillingness to sort of uh, conform to certain kinds of behavior rather than actually manifestations of, of mental illness. And, and that's the case in, in lots of other places as well. Um, in the case of the Chinese, uh, he um, observes a characteristic solidity and impassiveness, and he describes them as being very docile patients, very amenable to treatment. Um, one of the things that he fails to consider, although he says that, he, that there's a difficult on the part of the doctors to communicate with the Chinese patients, he fails to consider the fact that the Chinese patients were not able to understand what was happening around them. The language barrier was much bigger for them as well. And also they were coming from different areas in China, different regions, and the linguistic differences between themselves were quite uh, sort of considerable. So most likely they wouldn't have been able to communicate with each other and with the people that were supposed to be taking care of them. So he kind of overlooks uh, all sorts of issues there, but um, I still think it's quite, it's quite interesting. Um, sort of, um, at the same time, uh, in, in 1875, you've got Dr. Grieve, uh, Dr. Robert Grieve, that you can see there with his whole family. Um, he um, is appointed in 75 superintendent of um, the asylum in British Guyana. And um, he um, completely transforms the institution. He introduces moral management. He introduces all sorts of changes. But um, in particular, he um, notices he he, um, he starts producing a journal. And in his journal, he makes some very interesting observations on the etiology of insanity in different races. And he notices in particular a certain vulnerability of the Indian immigrants in comparison to Creoles and other ethnic groups. Um, the figures um, for the first five years of his um, management at the institution show a striking diversity in the proportion of inmates given to the asylum by the two greatest classes of the population, native-born and immigrants. And basically, of the 505 admissions that he records over the first five years, 171 were born in, in British Guyana, whereas 329 were immigrants, and more than half of those were of Indian origins. Um, what he does then is to um, take the census results for 1881 and to, determine, to try and determine the exact proportion of the insane to the different classes of the population. So he does compare the data that he collects in the asylum to the total population of the colony. 
Um, and again, sort of the figures are quite significant. Um, he comments on that particular table um, by observing that among the natives of the colony, per um, 10,000 of insane, among the natives of the colony, uh, the proportion of insanity is 7.6%, and um, amongst others living here but not born in the country is 217 or nearly three times as great. So um, he was um, convinced that there was a, 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 a striking um, um, sort of a, a higher liability to insanity on the part of the immigrants. And the speculations that he um, produces on the factors that contributed to that particular imbalance are quite um, interesting as well because he not only um, he not only establishes a connection between the modalities of labor recruitment in India and the high incidence of insanity um, among Indian immigrants in British Guyana by saying that um, not only uh, those people predisposed to insanity are more likely to migrate, but also by saying that the immigration agents in England uh, actually prey on those who are more um, sort of weaker and more feeble, and, and it's easier for them to persuade them to migrate because obviously they were paid by um, sort of the number of people that they managed to on the ship. So it was it was um, quite controversial as a as an issue. Um, but he also um, links the experience of migration to the insurgence of mental illness in a very explicit way. He, um, when he talks about the um, liability to insanity of the East Indian immigrants, he mentions four um, major factors, four major causes. He says the first one is um, the possibility that the immigrants would be living alone rather than in villages or in groups, as in the case of the Creole population. The second was the change of circumstances brought about by migration, and in particular, he mentions the separation from country and friends. The third element that he mentions is um, the fact that mentally unstable people were more easily persuaded by the, recruitments to, by the recruiters to leave their country. And finally, he mentions the ordeal of the journey and the trauma of adapting to a new place. And um, this, is, uh, this is from um, a journal that he published in 1881. Now, uh, ten years before, in 1871, there had been a report by the... Um, in 1870, there was a, there was a, a, a Royal Commission of Inquiry that was, um, that was established to uh, look at the conditions of the Indian immigrants in British Guyana, and they produced a, a really long report in 1871, um, and the striking thing when reading that report, um, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages, but they, they visited all the, um, the hospitals on the different plantations and looked at all the aspects of Indian immigration, but they didn't visit the asylum. It just doesn't appear at all in the report. So um, Grieb then moved to be Surgeon General of the colony and throughout his career he had sort of fairly strong conflicts and contrasts with the um, planters, with local planters. He was uh, very much a problem. He, he had the support of the government so he was very clever in gaining, sort of in advancing in his career but at the same time he was in constant conflict with the local planters. So there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting material to, to look at. But uh, just going back to um, the, the relation between sort of migration and um, mental illness, um, one of the um, other um, sort of it, it's obvious that some of the statistics that grief produces um, raise all sorts of questions, and the, the high presence of um, East Indian immigrants in particular in, in the asylum raises all sorts of questions. Um, one set of questions is related to the fact that their um, insanity was strongly linked to behavioral problems, to um, intemperance, to the use of alcohol, to the use of cannabis. Um, irregularity of behavior was one of the main causes, um, one of the main symptoms that described their illness. 
and it's it's very difficult to understand what that actually meant uh, in that particular context. But there was another element, another factor that I think is quite important, and that um, emerges when looking at the um, legislation in the colony. In 1864, there was an ordinance that established that if workers were sent to the hospital, to the local hospital, the cost of their treatment would fall on the planter, because basically... Um, they were considered to be property of the planters. They were imported for the planters to work on their plantations, so the planter was liable for the cost of um, their hospitalization. But if the patient was certified insane and was sent to the asylum, then the employer was relieved from any liability to payment. So it was actually very much in the interest of the planters to remove anyone who was causing problems on the plantation and get them committed to the asylum. So it's, there, there's a whole other story behind those, behind those numbers. I'm just going to conclude because I'm very sort of conscious of time. I just promised I would stick to half an hour. Um, I think it's interesting um, to just look at those um, cases and... Um, there's so much material when it comes to the Caribbean and so much material which is um, nation-specific. Um, there's um, there's uh, several sets of records for uh, each of the islands, for British Guyana, and they are different. Although there are some similarities, there are sort of considerable differences uh, in, in what they reflect. But it's interesting for me to, to see how... Um, Sort of the waves of migration are reflected in those statistics for the, um, for the in, in the admissions into the asylums, but also how um, those sort of mostly British doctors, like Dr. Sackham was was English, um, Grieve was Scottish, um, how those uh, British doctors were um, sort of sent to the colonies in a way to implement uh, the British system, uh, to implement. Um, sort of management strategies that were considered to be uh, viable in, in England, but also to see how they, because um, once they got over there, they were faced <coughs> with um, issues of ethnicity and they were faced with a, an asylum population that they were totally unfamiliar with. And it's interesting to see how they react and how they adapt to those different issues. Um, and also how they were sort of placed in a unique position to... Um, somehow produce knowledge about those particular, um, those particular um, different uh, groups of, um, of um, people considered to be insane um, and how they also uh, at the same time contributed to creating um, ideas of otherness and um, diversity and identity. So... Um, and I've got basically my conclusions when I was trying to write the conclusions to my paper was a long list of questions rather than answers. So <laughs> um, I think I'm just going to leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.